on now, so it's 11 o'clock. All righty. Well, look at this. Wonderful. All right. Well, I know in the United States, they, uh, they, they changed their clocks, but we didn't change them here. So I don't know what's quite is going on uh, this morning, but it is what it is. And uh, so here we are. So we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. It is 11 o'clock on the dot. Good morning, Miss Daisy. And uh, so we're going to get started today uh, and uh, hope and pray that uh, it, everything kind of fills in, if we will. So nice. Good to be here this morning. Good to see what the Lord is, is going to do and uh, with, uh, with everything. And uh, I believe I have a different slide up here in just a minute. So we're going to hold off just a little while for, um, for those. All right, cool. Um, did you say the, is Kate back there? Go ahead and have them come in here for now. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll excuse you guys just because we're going to do the, the deal after, uh, just before the uh, tithe and offering today. So very good, very good. So, all right. So anyway, so anyway, guys, just a quick announcements here this morning as uh, our normal announcements throughout the week. Uh, questions and answer Bible study is at 1 p.m. 1 p.m. Uh, this coming Tuesday via Zoom. Looking forward to that. Looking forward to a good time. And, and I got to be honest, because I really look forward to that at that time. And I know we have services on um we have services on uh, Wednesday as well, Wednesday morning, Wednesday evening, and, uh, and, and that's fine. Um, but <clears throat> we, uh, I enjoy the time of fellowship. I enjoy the times of Q&A. Uh, keeps us all hot. Keeps us uh, going in the studies there. And um, I, uh, I'm bringing them in, bro, uh, Andy. I'm bringing them in just because of what we got going on today. So anyway, all right, so Wednesday morning Bible study is at 11 a.m. Let's not forget that. We'll be back in our place. And then Wednesday night, 6 p.m. for our worship service. We're looking forward to being together. And uh, for some reason, I just noticed that on the screen, it actually says 7 p.m. So I don't know why it does. We are 6 p.m. on Wednesday evening, not 7 p.m. Uh, prayer, prayer revival uh, meeting is on Friday at 8.30 in the morning via Zoom. So let's make sure, let's stay on top of that, if we will, and together. And this week is Ladies' Devotion, yeah? No, next week. Okay, I'm sorry. Good, good, good. I, I was, I'm a week ahead of myself, all right? So Ladies' Devotion every other Thursday at uh, 10 a.m., and uh, that's not this week, but the following week. There you go. Cool. All right, what a blessing. And guys, it is, a, it is a blessing to be here this morning, and we do expect uh, others today, at least we hope so. And uh, we're praying for that. So let's go ahead and bow our heads and ask the Lord's blessing upon our service this morning. And then we'll go into our reading. And just to give you a little bit of an advance, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Luke. The book of Luke for our Bible reading this morning. So let's bow our heads and ask the, the blessing upon the Lord's service today. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, for who and what you are. We pray now for your con continual guidance and grace. And Lord, we ask for your help. We pray for your mercy this morning. We pray that you would richly and wonderfully bless us, dear God. We pray that you would meet with us, Lord, from on high. Uh, Lord, through the preaching and teaching of your word this morning, I pray that your will would be done. And Lord God, we just ask you that we leave the results to you. Uh, we pray that hearts and minds, Lord, would be willing to listen, uh, to uh, not only listen, Father, but to apply the teaching of the Holy Scriptures uh, in their life. So Lord, we give you honor, glory, praise. Thank you, dear Lord, for all that you've done and who and what you are. We, uh, we would go now and uh, just pray, dear God, that this would be a blessed service this morning. In Jesus' name we ask, amen and amen. So let's grab our Bibles out this morning, if you will, and let's turn to Luke in chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 is where we will be. And if you're willing and able to this morning, we ask you to stand as we honor the reading of the Word of God. Luke chapter 7. And we're going to read verses 11 through 16. As you know, today is a special day. And we'll get to that. That is next on our agenda this morning um, with the reading of the Scripture. So Luke chapter 7, look with me in verse 11 is where we will begin. The Bible says in Luke chapter 7 and verse 11, it says, And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. Many of his disciples went with him and much people. When he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. 
And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. Surely the reading of the word of God be a blessing to your heart and your mind this morning. May be seated if you will. Before we go into our first hymn this morning, we do have something to do. And uh, as you know, today is Mother's Day. So I want to say a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. And uh, with no joke whatsoever, uh, we would not be here without you. So we thank you for all the mothers. So I'm going to ask Bailey if she'll come here this morning. We have a little gift for you from, uh, from Sarah and Chapel Independent Baptist Church. And uh, even though Davith is not a mother, you can give him one to, to pass on to Kelly. And uh, so, uh, if you're a mother today, I just want to, if you will, if you don't mind standing real quick, we want to give you a little bit of an applaud, and then Bailey will come around. So stand if you are a mother, uh, if you will, today, and um, and we, you stand up. There you go. Good job. All right. So I just want to give you guys a hand. Let's all give them a hand, guys. Amen. Thank you for being who you are and what you have done. So Denise, or Bailey, if you'll go ahead and pass out the gifts this morning uh, to our mothers, make sure you give Davith one to pass along to, uh, to Kelly as well. And uh, we're thankful for you. And you may be seated, if you will, this morning. What a wonderful and tremendous blessing. Again, what the world would or would not be without mothers. Amen. We are greatly thankful for them. All right. And so speaking of mothers, this morning we have uh, chosen, I have chosen, I should say. Uh, did you notice I chose this on purpose? Yeah. So this uh, from the first week that I met Daisy, this is one of my this is one of my favorite hymns. It really is. Uh, I've always loved this hymn. And uh, we didn't sing this very often uh, for the first probably four years, five years of me pastoring in the States. And we started our church there. And uh, so and and so um, Bailey, if you uh, grab Miss Carol's, if you will, and give it give hers. Um, but we had a lady in our church. Her name was Lynn. And uh, Lynn, one time, because we would every every so often we would do request to hymns, and we would have a singing night before I preached, and uh, we'd have six or seven hymns that people would request, and we would sing them on the midweek service. And one night, this this lady named Lynn, she wanted to sing this song, "Jesus Loves Even Me," and uh, and I was like, "Yeah, we can sing that." Brother Pete was able to lead it and play it, and so we had a really good time, and it really was a blessing to me. Well, when I got over here, uh, back in 2014, um, somehow, some way, I brought the hymn up and. Uh, Daisy told me that was her mother's favorite hymn, and uh, so not a coincidence at all. I've chosen that for our opening song today, our opening hymn, I should say, and so Daisy's going to play that, guys. The words will be on the screen as always, and so if you will, uh, you, uh, you, you do what you want to with the hymn. I've got to say that. I know we had some changes. We'll go over those uh, a little later on this week on the changes of restrictions. Not much really affects us, thankfully, amen, and so Jesus loves even me. Do with it as you will. <clears throat> I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Amen. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad that Jesus loves even me? Now, before we dismiss our Sunday school class this morning and have Daniel come up, i got a prayer request, guys, if you guys will please um, at least write this down in, in, on the table of your heart. Those of you who know Brother Roger Tooley, he is a pastor over 
Ooh, I just had bad grammar there. Brother Roger Tooley is a pastor uh, over in Corby, England. Uh, he's been in country for about 24, 25 years now. Um, he is from the United States. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Roger got married when he was on deputation. And essentially, when they finished deputation, their honeymoon was the, the moving over, over to the U.K. Uh, for him to be a, a church planning missionary, which was many years ago. Um, Brother Tooley messaged me yesterday, let me know that his mother has had a stroke. Uh, they live in Ohio, back in the States. And uh, so she's had a stroke, and she's not expected to make it. Uh, secondary message yesterday was that they were moving her to hospice. He is flying to the States on Tuesday. The rest of the family is following him on Thursday. Uh, so guys, if you guys can remember the Thule family in prayer, and Brother Thule, safe travels, uh, with all the issues going on with, with flying, and uh, with all the, you know, just with the, the restrictions and the COVID, there's not any more stress that the man needs in his life, uh, given that he's going through this situation with his mother, okay? So guys, if you will, just remember them in prayer. I would greatly appreciate that, all right? At this time, we'll go and dismiss our Sunday school class, and as well, uh, Daniel, you can come this morning. It's that time that we come to give back unto the Lord as he has graciously given unto us. Our offertory song today is actually going to be um, Vast as an Ocean, so we're looking forward to to hear in that one. Bye, Maisie girl. You enjoy Sunday school class. Amen. So, all right. So, Sunday school class is dismissed. See you, Georgie boy. <laughs> Thumbs up, man. What a blessing. Amen. All right, guys. So, uh, let's bow our heads. If you will, Daniel, if you'll bless this morning's tithe and offerings, and then our offertory song will play. Amen. And please you know, keep all of them protected from COVID, from everything that I'm just going to say harm uh, them. So please uh, bless them much and please bless their offerings. In his name, pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Daniel. There we go.
Sí. Amen and amen. Well, praise the Lord. What a blessing it is to be, a, to be here today and be awake, alive, and I pray that you're enthusiastic and uh, excited about what the Lord has in store for us today. Again, I know I've already mentioned it, but I just want to say a happy, happy Mother's Day uh, to all the mothers out there today. And again, I, 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 I do not um, underestimate not only a mother, but I mean it when I say it. We could not be here without you today. Uh, we would not have a society, and uh, I mean, at least the good parts of society today, without mothers. I mean, you look at how society society has uh, has has dropped, and how the degradation of society is before our eyes. Can you imagine if we didn't have nurturing and loving mothers in the homes uh, today? Uh, I mean, my goodness, man! It, look, can you imagine how worse it would be? So, happy Mother's Day to all. Uh, we love you. And we are mightily thankful for you. Let's open our Bibles back up to Luke in chapter 7 this morning. Luke in chapter 7. We've already stood to honor the reading of the Word of God during our time of reading today. And therefore, you will not need to do so now. But we're going to reread verses 11 through 16. Luke chapter 7. Begin with me, if you will, in your heart in verse 11. The Bible says, And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, Many of his disciples went with him, and much people. When he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Much people of the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. He that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. There came a fear on all, the glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. I want you to look in verse 17 as well, just by way of context today. It says, And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for who and what you are, for all that you've done. And we, Lord, today, as we pay homage, Lord, as we want to honor mothers, let us never forget, dear God, the Lord Jesus Christ was sent as the only begotten Son of the Father and came by way of a virgin Mary, whom he had an earthly mother here on this earth. Undoubtedly, we understand that Jesus Christ is God and he knows all and he is all and always will be. But Lord, we want to thank you, Father, for you utilizing a vessel such as Mary, his mother, to bring forth the Son of the Lord, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, here on this earth. So, Lord, I pray today as we begin to look at this blessed little woman, this little woman, this widow of Nan, I pray, dear God, that we would remember such sacrifice, that we remember such commitment, such dedication, such joy that is found in motherhood, dear God, and the, in, the irreplaceable position that they hold. In Jesus Christ's name, we do ask. Amen and amen. Let me say this to you this morning, if we will, that mothers, again, are a vital part of our society. They are an intricate part and aspect of the home. Let me say this, and I want to be crystal clear with what I'm about to say, that no one can replace a mother. No one, no thing, uh, a man, under any circumstances, cannot replace the role of a mother. It, it doesn't really matter what situation you draw out, what you've put yourself into, what choices you've made. Uh, if you are a male today, if you were born a man, you are not, under any circumstances, a mother, nor will you ever be, okay? 
Uh, mothers are special, guys. Mothers are important. Mothers are something that, again, they're irreplaceable. They cannot be gone to the store and buy a new one. It doesn't work like that. Thank God for, for stepmothers today. Thank God that the Lord has saw fit for, for women to step in and replace maybe a lost mother through some tragedy or some event in their life. God does that. God is a God of replacements, but he's not a God of replacements with something that does not fit. He doesn't take a square peg and force it into a round hole. Amen. Now we look at Paul's life. Paul lost his mother. The Bible says that he, lo- he suffered loss of all things. Amen. And yet he refers to Rufus's mother as his own. That's God's handiwork in the life of the mighty apostle Paul. Amen. And amen. The Lord has designed the mother to be the part that she is in every aspect. Salary.com, as a matter of fact, salary.com conducted a study back in 2010. And what they did is they, attempt to, they attempted to place a monetary value uh, on the work of a stay-at-home mother, a stay-at-home mom, and they determined that if mothers were paid for the 10 most common tasks in the home, and those things would be laundry machine operator, janitor, um, van driver, you know, transport, computer operator, housekeeper, daycare center teacher, cook, chief executive officer, psychologist, and of course, a facilities manager, that they would be paid well over 110,000 pounds a year. The largest piece of the pie came from overtime pay. You know, you see, a man's work is usually from sun to sun, but a mother's work is never done. C.H. Spurgeon said this. He said, those who think that a woman detained at home by her little family is doing nothing, think the reverse of, of what is true. Scarcely can the godly mother quit her home for a place of worship, but dream not that she is lost to the work of the church. Far from it. She is doing the best possible service for the Lord, for her Lord. Mothers, the godly training of your offspring is your first and most pressing duty as a mother. Now, a wife's first ministry is her husband, and a husband's first ministry is his wife. But a parent's first ministry are their children. Beloved, I can sit here and tell you today that my four children were reared up on a church pew. They were, they, they were raised up on a church pew. And as much as, as, much and as often as we had church uh, raising them up, the, the hours that they spent in a church pew or in a church house did not make them be able to function appropriately inside the house of God. But rather, it was my wife, Denise, and of course, she's in Sunday school class today. She'll watch this sermons later on. But it was her work, her labor, every single day that produced our children, that the byproduct was seen on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, uh, in the house of God at every revival meetings when they sat there and they listened in their church house. It was her labor, her work. She used to sit our kids down every day. It started out being five minutes, and then it worked its way up to eight minutes, and then to 10 minutes, and 11 minutes, 12 minutes. And she would sit them down uh, in the chairs at home and say, okay, now it's church time. And she would either play a short section of my sermon, or sometimes even David would get up. Little David, was uh, he was that tall, and, and he would get a hymnal, and he would get up, and he would act like he's preaching, amen? And the kids would sit there in those, in those chairs, and they were playing like they were in church. But what they were doing is they were learning, amen? Uh, guys, when we had built our new building in the church, uh, the nursery did not come a place of playpen. The nursery was a training facility for the house of God. And guys, it was rooted and grounded in mothers and by mothers. I want to stress to you today that mothers are irreplaceable. They are wonderful. They are so preciously underappreciated in our society today and even in our own circles. Can I say this to you this morning that mothers are unique neurologically? Neurologically, I want to say that. I've mentioned this to you before, how a woman will use more of her brain than a man. Studies have revealed the the corpus callosum, which is the portion of your brain that separates the right and the left side, is relatively larger than it is with men, and here's the reason why. There's more information passing from the right to the left and the left to the right. The brain is a muscle, it's an organ, and the more it is used, the more it is defined and the more that it will grow just like any other muscle in your body. And so the left side being primarily logical and the right side being primarily emotional, or at least the, the uh, portion of emotions is found in, the, uh, in that particular side on the right side, women, yes, are driven more emotionally than men. But to be a mother today, it is, requires both logic and emotions. 
uh, it, it, it is quite different than it is with men. The link between a mother and a child is absolutely profound, and it cannot be replaced even by dad uh, at all or by a male. It's so remarkable that studies have revealed, they found that, that it is common for cells from one individual to be integrated into the tissues of another distinct person. Now, I want to read to you about what I mean by this. In this particular study, male cells were found in the brains of women, and it was determined that they had been living there for over decades. The cells that they particularly found inside these uh, women's brains were the cells of their own children some being male, some being female. It reveals, it was also revealed that these cells were less common found in the brains of women who had suffered or been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, suggesting that there may be a relation to the health of the brain with these particular cells. What that means is some of those cells from the pregnancy stays inside the mother's brain and it changes it for the rest of her life. Further studies reveal that, uh, that pregnancy does seem to change a woman's brain, and they, they assume this changed the brain permanently. And she can, and, but it changes it permanently so that she can better connect with other people. The biggest changes were concentrated in the region of the brain called, this, uh, called sympathetic, sympathetic uh, pruning, or synaptic pruning, sorry. And it occurs a few times in the life cycle. But with ladies, it shows to help mothers navigate social interactions and form close relationships with others. In other words, the change that unfolds in a pregnant woman's brain almost certainly indicates that she's growing as a person, especially when it comes to figuring out what other people need and what other people feel. Neurologically, guys, women, mothers, wives, they have something. We, call it, well, we, we, we blanket call it woman's intuition. But it is a divine design that God has put there, I believe, for the protection of the family and for the needs of the family and the needs especially of their own children. Not only are mothers unique neurologically, but guys, mothers are special emotionally. Building off of this neurological uniqueness of mothers, uh, this has equipped women to be specifically or special, if you will, emotionally. We find in the emotional aspect of mothers, uh, the natural response to a mother is to nurture and to care for her children, to love them even in times when they need to learn a lesson. Emotionally, a mother is, uh, has this keen drawing element about them that will bring a child to them in their loving arms. It's something that's interesting, but I'll tell you what, I went back and I found that the Lord himself even uses this as an illustration for his love toward Jerusalem. The Bible says in Isaiah 66, verse 13, As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. So as the Lord uses it in illustration how a mother will comfort their child, they'll comfort their son, the Lord said, I'm going to comfort you in Jerusalem. So women are special. Mothers are special emotionally. They're unique neurologically. They're strong physically, okay? Now, some of you men may be sitting here going, hang on a second now, I'm stronger than my wife. Um, you know, Denise and I may pull a close draw sometimes. She's, she's strong in all kinds of ways, amen? And uh, I'm not going to cross her, I can go ahead and tell you that. And uh, I wanted so bad last week, uh, I missed, uh, apparently it was International Mother Women's Day. Guys, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of the world's worst for these new holidays and these new special days that are being applied. I just can't keep up with them. But apparently it was International Women's Day the other day, and I missed it. Uh, but I have a photo of Denise, and she was dressed up rather nice in a nice dress. We were on the, uh, the ship, I believe, for our 20th anniversary uh, a few years back. And I said, let me see that gun, Denise. And Denise popped that gun up and you know, Nacy's got some guns, I mean, that really would rival some men. And uh, my son, Darius, used to say that his, uh, his arm goals, his muscular arm goals, was his mother's arm. So I don't know what that says about me, but nonetheless, she has a pretty big bicep, right? And I, and I told Denise, I said, I want to put this picture out, and I'll photo out and say, you know, for International Women's Day and show how strong women are. And uh, I, I missed the boat on that one. Maybe I can wait till next year. But I'm going to go ahead and tell you, women are strong. Mothers are especially strong physically. I want you to think about this, especially guys, you listen carefully. The pain threshold that mothers have is an amazing and wonderful blessing to be able to give birth. I love the issue. I love it when Pharaoh said, hey, listen, I want you to kill all those, those Hebrew babies that come. And of course, they were convicted by God, you know, and, and uh, when 
of course, they told a story, and the Lord still blessed them for it. They told, a, they told a lie. They said, hey, look, man, they're not like other women. Uh, when they were up on the stools, that baby just came on out, like no problem whatsoever. They didn't want to kill the child uh, uh, under Pharaoh's rule. But nonetheless, women, guys, they have a pain threshold that I don't believe the average man has. The Bible uses the word travail as a woman in travail. The word travail means painful or laborious effort. I would go ahead and say today that most men, given their reaction to a hangnail or a paper cut, would not last 6 to 8 to 10, 12 hours in labor. Can I get an amen right there? I'm with you. The Lord truly has blessed mothers with an endurance level beyond what most men can comprehend. That's why I say to you again today, men cannot, will not replace my. I don't care what law is written. I don't care what some, dude, you can identify as a rock. You may be hard as a rock in your head, but you ain't a rock, amen. You can go stand in a garage all day long. It doesn't make you a car. I don't care what you think you are, what you identify are. You are what God made you to be, amen. You're not going to replace a mother. Mother, and I tell you what, what my challenge is, if you want to be a mother, men, have birth, amen. No epidural, no pain medicine, you're going to give birth. You know what? The closest thing that I've ever heard people say that it's like would be kidney stones, okay? It would be when a man gets a kidney stone and how painful that is. I've seen women pass kidney stones, not watched them do it, but I've seen them endure kidney stones and suffer from kidney stones and pass them, even though they were in agonizing pain, do so with almost, you know, not even flinching. And I've watched men suffer in dire pain, in sweats, and pleading to God to take their life like Elijah underneath the juniper tree in the midst of one stone. So I'm telling you right now, if you want to be a mother, guys, give birth. See how that works out for you, okay? Women, mothers are strong physically, amen. Let me say this to you. Mothers are also powerful mentally. They are powerful mentally. Again, this kind of ties back into the neurological aspect of it. And I'm not going to overkill you this morning with all of this. But women who become pregnant between, uh, between the scanning sessions begin to show neural changes so distinct that computers could distinguish between a pregnant woman and a non-pregnant woman simply based upon their brain scans alone. The heightened estrogen and proestrogen, proestrogen hormones of pregnancy trend back some of what's called the gray matter in your brain. The cell branches that connect neurons to one another begin to change, which has an effect of sharpening, not diminishing, mental capacities. Most people say, hey, listen, I got, I got dumber when I, uh, when I got pregnant. And that's not true at all. The actual, the mental capacities of a mother begins to sharpen as a result of the pregnancy. The neural pathways that remain are streamlined and strengthened in the midst of the process. Now, I want to share something with you. Benjamin Spock. You may not remember who he was. He led the way among child-rearing professionals and instructed parents not to discipline their children. He said that doing so would damage the, damage the children's ego, like there's a danger of that. Later in his life, he realized that he had made a massive mistake, and this was his, his, some of his final words. He says, we have reared a generation of brats. Parents aren't firm enough with their children for fear of losing their love and incurring, uh, incurring their resentment. He goes on to say, this is a cruel deprivation that we, I should, he should say I, because he's the, he's the grandfather of it, we professionals have imposed on mothers and fathers. Of course, we did it with the best intentions. Okay, that's nice to say after, you know, decades of delinquence and the rise of crime. But he goes in and says, we did not realize until it was too late how our know-it-all attitude was undermining the self-assurance of parents. Guys, it, should, it, it, it did not take, or at least it should not have taken, a trial run of millions of homes, okay, as a Petri dish, or as a test tube, if you will, or as, a, as, a, as a, an experiment to disprove this, this theory. The Bible concluded it long ago. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15 says, The rod of reproof giveth wisdom. Now listen to this. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Guys, can I tell you right now that there is a connection between children and mothers that is irreplaceable. The mothers are raising their children. The mothers are there comforting their children, nourishing their children, bringing nurturing aspects and love and, and care to their children. Mothers today are something to be respected, honored, and they should be praised. Amen. 
In our text today, we are introduced to this little woman, this little widow of Nain. It's the village of Galilee. And we know that she's lost her husband because she's uh, taken on the, the title of a widow. But there's something, God, can I say this really about marriage real quick? There's something special about marriage. Marriage is divinely designed. Marriage is not constructed in the, in the courtroom. Marriage is not created in the back alleys. Marriage is not, and not something that's done by accident. You don't throw two sticks down and jump over them three times and all the time, you, all of a sudden you're married. Marriage is a constitution of God. Matter of fact, it's the first institution that was created. There's something special about it divinely designed by the creator himself from the very beginning as a matter of fact the marriage is so special that the lord uses it as a blueprint um, between the relationship of him and the church ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 uh, beginning says husband love your wives even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not have a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Down in verse 32, he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. There is an identity in marriage. Why do you think marriage is being attacked in the world today? There is an identity in marriage, whereas a, uh, the man is the husband and the, and the lady is a wife. There, there, there's something unique about it. To be identified as a husband or a wife is a tremendous and wonderful blessing it is. But this dear lady here, I want, you to, I want you to step into her role with me this morning. To the best of mine and your ability, I want us to not only empathize with her, but I want us to try our best to put on the robes of where she stood she had lost this identity. She lost the identity of a wife and now assumed the identity of a widow. Doesn't make her a less person, doesn't make her less anything. It just means she's went from one to another. It's a transition. Now, the unfortunate incident has also brought about the loss of something else, the loss of another position, at least in the living aspect of things. She lost her only son. Now, I don't know if she had daughters. When you read the context, it doesn't seem as if she does. But even if she did, those daughters would have left home and, and they would have been the, uh, the wives of other, of, of other men now and having their own families. Uh, the, the home would have been empty, man. She's lost this element of parental guidance, a position of leadership and position of love. Oh, beloved, there is something so very special concerning being a parent the love of a dad or a mom uh, has for their children is something else that is also irreplaceable. The hurt they bring is equally painful because the love is so incredibly great. No one can understand what love I'm speaking of this morning until they experience it for themselves by becoming a parent. There's a joy in living right. There is a joy in living the way God has ordained us. There's a joy, guys, in waiting for the right person, young people. Loving them correctly through courtship, marriage, and then parenting. See if we can get that order correct today in our world. Oh, what a joy it is. I remember the day, it'd be 23 years come November, that I kissed my bride on the altar and married her. Oh, I remember like it was yesterday. What a special day it was. I loved it. And nine months later, we became parents. And a little bit earlier than we anticipated, David was about a month early, but nonetheless, there's something about the positions in marriage. This lady had experienced being a wife, and now she's a widow. And she had experienced being a parent. And now the heartache sets in. The loss of a spouse was followed now by the loss of a son. This blessed lady, this dear lady who was willing to give of herself to the raising of her child, the sacrificial love that she would, uh, she would have invoked in his life uh, by preparing him uh, nutritionally and nurturing him to make him ready for the world, amen. Now she's without opportunity to perform these things. Hey guys, let me say this to you this morning and and. and the ladies can, I'm sure, understand this greater than we can. There is great labor in the home for providing meals, clean clothes, an organized home, as well as a litany of other things. My wife has always kept a clean and organized home. 
She was responsible for the most part of, of homeschooling all four of our children as I worked and uh, was a pastor as well as uh, in business. And, and uh, uh, you know, she did a remarkable job and is still to this day doing remarkable job. I mean, she would be on her feet, I'm telling you, from before daylight until well after dark. But one day, listen carefully. One day, the opportunities to do these things, even though they're labor, even though they're work, yes, it's trying to educate four children. Yes, it's trying to have to wash the clothes of six people. Yes, it's trying to try to keep a house, especially when it was a big house, try to keep it clean and organized. And, and then at the same time, keep yourself presentable. My wife was convicted, and, and this is all her, not me. I never had a, a word in edgewise on this one. But she, wa- she wanted herself to be presentable when I came home from the office every single day. I didn't show up to the house. I cannot tell you one time in all of these years that I showed up to my house and my wife looked like garbage. She looked like the lady from Hee Hall. That doesn't mean anything over here, but she had rollers in her hair and no makeup. There was not one time I can remember her doing it because she herself was convicted that she wanted to be presentable when I walked through the door. And again, that's all her, man. I'd take her either way. But I remember... I remember the trying days, the laborious days, the, the struggle when some of the kids and the guys, in all fairness, i got to be honest, all four of our children were easy, easy to raise, but, but, but even in, in when, they would, when it would be quite difficult in school and, and it would be hard to get them to, to, to do or understand a few things, and, and, uh, and then, you know, th- then there's the task of lunch, and then there's the task of snacks, and all these different things, and we did raise our children to be independent and take responsibility of themselves, but... I remember sitting her down and saying, honey, here's the thing. One day, the opportunity to make a sandwich for the children is going to be gone. One day, to be able to fold those little clothes up is going to be lost. Our kids wash their own clothes now. Daniel has Tuesday, Billy has Thursday. That's when they come down and wash their clothes. One day, this, these tasks that may seem menial and sometimes overbearing in your life, that opportunity is going to be lost either through death or just simple departure. There's an element of pain that is involved when you close that chapter in your life. I want you to notice something interesting with me this morning in our passage. Again, try, to, try your best to step in her shoes. She's lost her husband. There's no record or mention of any daughters. But the Bible is very clear that this was her only son. Just him and her in the house. And he, was a, he was a young man, the Bible says, so he was, not a young, he was not a child. He was a young man. Undoubtedly, he was working, but I can see her getting up before the sun rises, that Proverbs 31 woman, and I can see her making food for him to take in his little brown bag to, to whatever job he had. Maybe he was a fisherman. Maybe he was a, uh, a carpenter, whatever it may have been. But I can just see her tending to some of her, those needs and really enjoying it. Oh, that's gone now. She's weeping, as we find, of course, we know that in verse 13. But I want you to notice something very interesting, especially concerning what has transpired up until this point in the book of Luke. No one, listen carefully, no one interceded on her behalf. No one came to the Lord and said, man, listen, we got a woman over here. No no one came to Jesus and said, listen, there's a widow over here and she's bawling her eyes out. She's lost it all. No one came to our Lord and Savior and said, listen, just, I, want, I, want to, I want to give you a truth. Man, there is a funeral over here. The procession's going this way. It's a little bit clogged up. But there's a, there's a mother who just lost her only son today. And man, she is, in, she is a train wreck right now. No one interceded on her behalf. Jarius interceded for his daughter leading up to this. Friends of the centurion interceded for him, uh, for the Lord to, uh, to come to his servant and heal him. The neighbors interceded for the paralytic, but this blessed widow, this sweet mother, no one. You say, why, preacher? I can't answer why. I can say this. I believe the Lord is going to use it as an example. There was no one there for this dear lady, this blessed mother, who had lost so much. Yet widows, the widow is specially cared for by God. Psalm 68.5 says, A father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. 
think the Lord was going to use this situation so he could bring the Bible more clear to the people in the community. I believe in all of my heart that the Lord took notice of her this day. He knows all things. He's created all things. We understand that. I think, listen, the neurological changes that occur in the brain, they're created of God in women. They are divinely designed to occur so the Lord knew what she had experienced neurologically, emotionally, mentally, and physically. He knew all those things because he's the one that created them and put them there. Not just in her, but in all. He knew what loss she was experiencing this day as well. So I want you to notice what our Lord and Savior, what he saw in this precious widow, this mother. The first thing he saw was great sorrow. Verse 12 says, Now when they had came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a, a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, he said, weep not, he said. Guys, we can almost feel her grief in the words that Luke is used by inspiration of God here. We can almost experience her grief having lost her only son. Listen, Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father. He knew what it meant to be the only son there, if you will. He was a young man. There would have been hope for, uh, for support throughout their life. The fulfillment of her watching her only son to become a man that the Lord wanted him to be. She was looking forward to the days of him marrying and, and having children and grandchildren and all these different things, all of it taken taken away. She was a widow, guys. It must have multiplied her grief. Loss of hope and comfort in her own life. A stricken, empty home would speak volumes as she would return to it. Beloved, we can all recall in our hearts how many stricken homes have suffered this type of pain and anguish. The Lord saw all these things. The Lord saw this procession moving along and this dead man being carried in a, a, a beer or carried in a casket there and the mother coming along and weeping and pouring her eyes out and the Lord saw her sorrow. I want you to notice not only did he see sorrow, but I want you to see our Lord and Savior's sympathy. His sympathy. Look in verse 13 again with me. It says, And when the Lord saw her with his eyes, he had compassion on her and said to her, weep not. May I say this to you this morning, guys, that sympathy is defined as the, a feeling of sorrow for someone else's misfortune. The Lord not only felt this sympathy, but he did something with it. And herein lies the difference. It is one thing to feel sorry for someone. It is one thing to have pity on others. It is a whole other thing to have a reaction into action. And that's what is called compassion, to co-suffer with someone. You can pity someone across the street, but until you do something about it, your feelings mean nothing at all. That is compassion. Ten times in the gospel is the, is the is, uh, compassion of Christ mentioned. He, the perfect man, knew how to weep with them and he knew how to help them who wept. His sympathy was real. It wasn't simply emotion, but it was something that led to motion. It was not simply a feeling, but it was, follow, it was, it was led to a follow-through. It was not just simply words, but it led to work. And beloved, he felt and experienced sympathy for this dear widow, which led him into action of compassion. Christ saw her sorrow. And he did something with his sympathy. And what did he do? He honored her sacrifice. Oh, this widow of Nain is a mother's story. It's a mother's story. Verse 12 tells us clearly, Now, when he had came nigh uh, to the, gates, the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out. Watch these next few words. The only son of his mother. And when you look over there in verse 15, after the Lord Jesus Christ brought him back to life, it says, and, and, and he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother, the only son of his mother. Guys, she received her son back, back from the dead. Her loss, met, her loss met the Lord Jesus Christ in the street, and she came in connection with the love of the Lord, the love which was, uh, was of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you may ask, what sacrifice was she uh, being honored for? Beloved, the only thing greater than a mother's sacrifice is a mother's love. 
The only thing greater than a mother's sacrifice is a mother's love. You say, well, why did Jesus Christ bring that young man back to, the, back to life? Was it for him? So that he'd have an extended life on this earth? No. You know, the Lord was dear friends with Lazarus. He loved Lazarus. He loved Mary. He loved Martha. And he wept at the tomb, but he wept not over the death of Lazarus. He wept over the unbelief of those that were around him. And he called Lazarus forth, not to give Lazarus more time, but to prove himself amongst the people. He brought forth this young man out of this casket to sit up and start speaking. He brought him back to life, not to give him an extended life in this earth, but to comfort that woman, that widow, because of her sacrifice. I'm telling you, mothers are unique and they're special. They're blessed. Mother's sacrifice of their time, my friend, day in and day out, a mother's, uh, a mother's sacrifice, a mother's time. Listen, mothers are, are, are laboring to ensure the quality of their children. Home is where children learn. It is home where they learn how to live and function in society. It is home where they learn the commitment of the church house. It is home where they learn to properly tithe and give to missions. It is home, my friend. That's where they learn. Amen. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Together is the most beautiful word in the dictionary outside of the word mother. The Lord looked at this lady and knew that she had sacrificed her time and taking care and, and nurturing this young man and bringing him up and raising him up. And she had suffered all of this other loss of her husband, but now she, she had lost her, so she saw the sacrifice. He saw the sacrifice of her time in her entire life. Mothers sacrificed their temperament. Oh, there are days when mothers are so frazzled. Now, I'm, not, I'm, a, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a man. I, I can't speak to personal um, experience with this but i'm a son and i have a mother who invested her her time and and dealt with her temperament in raising me i'm a i'm a i'm a husband to a wife who is a mother of four children and and i've been there with her when she's been frazzled and given up so much broken and beaten down from just the simplest of all tasks in the home and and yet maintaining their character and their disposition greater than any Oh, you give me the mindset of a mother. and You take that mindset of a mother, that protective and providential nature of a mother, and put that into soldiers today. That would be the strongest army that this world would ever see. Temperament of mothers. Not only do they sacrifice their time, not only do they sacrifice their temperament, but my friend, these precious ladies sacrifice their treasure. This dear woman, this dear widow of Nain, this mother's story that we find here, she invested her entire life into raising that young man. A godly mother understands the greatest treasure is found in the investment of those dear and wonderful children that will one day leave their home. Investment of wonderful kids, wonderful young ladies, and wonderful young men who will become productive citizens in society promoters of the gospel, people who will take a stand on the right thing. The widow of Nain, it's a mother story. I love this story because it is so small, but it is so large at the same time. It is but a very small story that is sandwiched on the backside of a multitude of miracles that have happened, many of them based on faith, many of them based on, on energy, many of them based on strength, and many of them based on sacrifice and, and what people will do for others. And then here's this lady who suffered all this loss. She had sacrificed her treasure, her temperament, and her time in her life of raising this young man, and now somehow, some way, he has died. And the Lord looked at her. He honored her not as a widow. He honored her as a mother. He honored her. He could have brought back the husband as well if he wanted to, but at the moment, he brought back her son. I believe in all of my heart today, guys. The Lord Jesus Christ took this opportunity to show us the importance and that mothers weigh in society. It's a mother's story, this widow of Nain. It's another story that is so vitally important for each and every one of us. But the Lord Jesus Christ took the time to reveal unto us His love 
his heart, his compassion on mothers. You say, well, preacher, what about fathers? Well, it ain't Father's Day. Amen. It's Mother's Day. And I believe today that we need to take time to honor our mothers. We need to take time to be thankful for what they have done. What, they, what my wife has done for, for our four children, uh, I, couldn't even write the, I, I couldn't even write the amount of sacrifice that she's in, in the, what she's invested into her life. Guys, I'm going to tell you right now, and I know she's not in here. Uh, she is a hero of mine. I've watched her over these last 23 years and, and what she has given up and what she has done to make sure our children receive the mother that they need. And they receive the raising and the rearing and the nurturing. I mean, the things that she has, the things that she does. I've watched her labor in the kitchen, just the kitchen alone, back and forth, making meals, going from the kitchen to the washroom, washroom to the kitchen, grabbing a Hoover. I mean, I'm telling you right now, in my mind, she's a hero of mine. And I just am so fortunate enough to be able to, to marry her and be married to her. A mother's story we find with this widow of Nan. What a tremendous story it is. So guys, let's take the time today. Honor and remember our mothers. Your, mothers may, your mother may not be on this earth any longer, but you thank God for him giving you the days, the times, the years that he gave you with her and that which he instilled in you. I'm convinced even in the darkest days and even probably in the most, in the most uh, troublous of childhoods, there's something of educational value that each and every one can learn about who and what their mother is. I look back in my life and I look at what my mom, I can remember sitting on the sofa, my mom quizzing me on state capitals and quizzing me on spelling bees and quizzing me on my math and the amount of labor that she put into my life and education after school in the evening times. It's incomprehensible. I never went without a meal. I typically had a warm meal every single morning. You know, maybe on Saturdays I'd eat cereal and watch cartoons, but I can remember as a child, guys, I'm not going to, I'm not going to just lengthen this sermon, I'm not, but, but I can remember as a young child before school in the wintertime, my mom would take a blanket and she'd put it in front of the fire as I got dressed to go to school and I'd come sit down and I'd be tired and weary and not really wanting to go, but I'd sit down at the, at the table and she'd have my cream of wheat there. I like cream of wheat with a little sugar on top of it. And my milk. And she'd take that warm blanket that she took off the fireplace and she'd wrap it around me just so I could have a little bit of warmth for a few minutes in breakfast that morning before I went off to be at school. There's nothing like a mother's love. Men will never replace it. Computers will never replace it. Social media is not going to replace it. God has divinely designed the mothers today. and We should remember them. We should honor them because they are precious in his sight. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for who and what you are. Lord, I, I thank you, dear God, for this testimony of this dear woman that you have saw fit to give us a perfect and purified record. I thank you, Lord, for allowing us to, to experience it, Father. And I thank you, Lord, for, for the Lord Jesus Christ's compassion that he had in her life, that he comforted her showing us and revealing to us what is so important. Lord, I thank you for mothers. I thank you for my mother. I thank you for all that she is for me and that she's done for me and who and what you have allowed her to have in my life. I thank you, dear Lord, for my children's mother, for the quality that she is, uh, the type of mother that she is, that which she's proven. Lord, I thank you for every mother in here today, everyone that is represented. Lord, I pray a special blessing upon their lives. In Jesus Christ's name we ask. Amen and amen. I realize I went a little longer today. And uh, I don't know why that's up there twice. We go to our closing hymn this morning. Again, guys, I hope and pray that the, the preaching and teaching was a blessing to your heart today. But I never want you to underestimate the power and the love that a mother has. Amen. All right. Leaning on the everlasting arms, you do with the hymn this morning as you see fit as Daisy plays. Thank mm-hmm. you.
Safe and secure from all of on clearly. Clearly on the everlasting love. Amen and amen. Well, praise the Lord. Lean on the everlasting arms. Well, it's only 12.02, and uh, so we're not too far over. I did, did go a little longer than I anticipated today, uh, but I hope and pray that it was a blessing to you this morning. Just as a quick reminder, guys, uh, Tuesday morning, uh, Tuesday, sorry, Tuesday afternoon at uh, 1 p.m. is our questions and answer session via Zoom. Wednesday morning at 11 and Wednesday evening at 6 p.m., okay? Wednesday morning at 11 and Wednesday uh, evening at 6 p.m. for our services on Wednesday. And then Friday this week is our, our revival prayer team. We'll meet at 8.30 via Zoom. Looking forward to being together, guys. Uh, uh, there will be some updates that I'll send out. I'm sure most of you saw um, uh, Drakesford's announcements for uh, shielding should end at this month, so those who have to shield should end on the 31st of March, if I read that correctly. And uh, so we are looking to have a, uh, an, our Easter service today. Uh, I'm going to challenge you guys, invite friends and family, neighbors, co-workers, whomever it may be. I'm going to throw that and put, put some responsibility out in your hands today. Re invite them to the Easter service, okay? If you have somebody that you've been talking to, that you've been witnessing to, and, and they're right there on it, or if you've got somebody who has a church and they're not quite open yet, bring them in on Easter, guys, and we'll lift up and we'll exalt the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and hope and pray uh, that the Lord will touch and tender them. We are going to be doing a campaign pain here uh, in the village, but I'm asking you as well, get involved with those closest to you. Bring them in here. Let's get them in the house of God uh, for Easter. Amen. All right, guys, have yourself a wonderful rest of your Sunday. If you have your mother here, make sure you tell her happy Mother's Day. Make sure you hug her neck and tell her you love her. Uh, if not, you just thank the Lord for the mother that he gave you for the time that he did and uh, make sure you inform her today. Now, us being Americans, my wife gets two of them. Okay, she gets an American uh, uh, Mother's Day and she gets a British Mother's Day. What a blessing that is, amen? And I was wondering, we were talking about it today. We are filing for our British citizenship. We're in the process of starting that now. And I said, well, when you, we get that, I thought, well, no, if we got dual citizenship, you still get two Mother's Days. Well, hallelujah. I don't understand what the deal is on, on Father's Day. How come we don't have, they're on the same day, both here in the States and in the UK. So, and we got shortchanged again. Amen? No. Guys, have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you for being here. We'll dismiss in prayer. Daniel, if you don't mind this morning, will you dismiss us in prayer, please, sir? Amen, amen, amen.